morning everybody and welcome to Ripple Parish Church for our annual Sealed Knot service. Uh, if you've not met me before, my name's Barry, I'm a vicar here in Ripple. It's a real pleasure to see you all today. Uh, so without further ado, please would you stand for the procession of the standard bearers.
Lady of the Lilies, Christ was born across the sea. It's a little bit of poetic license from the author of, of the song. But the bit about Christ dying to make men, dragons and women, obviously, holy, that's not poetic license. That's God's great promise and gift to us through Jesus. The Bible tells us that the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, because we have faith in Christ, we can dare to approach God with confidence and confess our sins before him. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you with our whole hearts our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts we have done to others, and the good we have left undone. O oh God, forgive us and raise us to the newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's now 35 years since Brigadier Peter Young, the founder of the Sealed Knot Society, died. And he is the focus of our 2023 annual service of remembrance. Firstly, however, we would wish to cast our thoughts to where we all are and why we are gathered inside this tranquil and unspoiled lovely medieval church of St. Mary's Ripple. The hamlet of Ripple did not escape the attention of the Normans who invaded England and was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Today's perception of where we now are may well be that it is one of the diminishing numbers of places in our country nowadays where time appears to have stood still. Today's illusion, though, belies the reality of yesteryear. This village church invaded England and was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Today's perception of where we now are may well be that it is one of the diminishing numbers of places in our country nowadays where time appears to have stood still. Today's illusion, though, belies the reality of yesteryear. This village church would have been a meaningful centre within Ripple's community, surrounded by the hustle and bustle of those living here went about their daily lives. And during its construction, one can visualise this area would have been noisily engaged by those involved in flurries of dedicated and purposeful activity during the many years it took for this church to be built. Constructing the church during the 12th and 13th centuries, circa 1190, was a noble, ambitious and extensive enterprise, employing a large workforce. At this point, it is worth noting also that it was local craftsmen who carved the much acclaimed misericords, rather than monks, which was more than usual. There are 16, a dozen depicting agricultural tasks relating to the months of the year, and four depicting the blessings of providence. This legacy reflects the thinking of the medieval mind and the importance attached to the land and being ever mindful of religious faith. Church records and ancient graves give indication of local dignitaries contributing funds towards the costs of building St Mary's Ripple, which holds the distinction of being the largest medieval church in Worcestershire. 
Ripple Church and Parish are in the Upton on Severn district of Worcester. Upton being about four miles away and Worcester slightly further. Dukesbury in Gloucestershire is much nearer. The county boundary near the River Severn passes through this village. Ripple was easily accessible and well placed commercially and was relatively prosperous. The area was certainly not overlooked by significant national events in the development of our green and pleasant land. In May 1471, a decisive battle in the Wars of the Roses between the Yorkists and Lancastrians took place at Tewkesbury, which may not have affected those living in Ripple to any great extent. However, a century later, the Reformation could not be overlooked any more than the outbreak of the Civil War in the 17th century could be ignored. An early battle taking place on Ripple Field in April 1643. The long drawn out conflict between the Royalists and Parliamentarians came to an end on the 3rd of September in 1651. In common with today's world, four bears in Ripple were living through history in the making and times of significant change, which some perhaps didn't want to accept. They too had their share of anxieties, sadness, excitement and foreboding. Throughout landmarks in our history, this St Mary's has absorbed changes brought about in the past and has stood the test of time by being there, providing solace and support for its parishioners. I will now quote some lines by Sir Arthur Bryant, a renowned historian living from 1899 to 1985. The key to a nation's future is in her past. A nation that loses it has no future. St Mary's links with history are strong. It is listed as a grade one historic church and is seen as part of our heritage. Sadly, the building now is in poorer condition, necessitating in St Mary's being placed on an at-risk register. Avenues for the raising of considerable funds essential for conservation and refurbishment of this precious ancient church are ongoing and I believe it is our duty to support it. Linking up with the present and in a congregation amongst which it can't escape notice that many are attired in an old-fashioned style of costume, I would draw your attention to the area on the left of the pulpit. During the late 20th century, a memorial window was installed in tribute to and in remembrance of Brigadier Peter Young, a commando and much decorated soldier in the Second World War, and later the inspirational founder of the Sealed Knot Society, members of which are present and attired in replica styles of 17th century costume. The Brigadier lived in this area during his final years and used to worship in St Mary's and in consequence St Mary's has become the mother church of the sealed knot. Our memorial service <clears throat> is held annually 
on the second Sunday in October, and the sealed knot book of remembrance is kept in the cabinet near the memorial window and can be viewed at the end of the service. The sealed knot is the oldest and largest reenactment society in the United Kingdom, and we are both humbled and proud of our association with St Mary's, Ripple, and find the shared link of history a fascinating common bond. It is indeed possible that some 400 years ago, others in similar styles of dress to the sealed knot were worshipping in St Mary's and if our outfits, now as authentic as we hope they have become, would not bat an eyelid at us, but rather be curious about the attire of the rest of the congregation. I'll leave you to this interesting motion. Are we going to stand and sing our second hymn, I Vow to Thee My Country? <laughs> The early years and education of Peter Young. It was during the First World War that Peter Young was born in Kensington, London, on July 28, 1915. The overconfident predictions of the previous year that the war would be over by Christmas were proving by that time to be unrealistic. Peter's parents were Dallas Hales Wilkie Young and Irene Barbara Lushington Meller, known as Barbara. His father was a clerk in the Admiralty Supreme Court of Judicators and his mother was the daughter of a clergyman. Four years after Peter was born, the family was complete with the birth of a daughter, Pamela, 
1919. Peter and Pamela were close throughout their lives. Peter spent some time on family research. On both sides, although not aristocratic, his pedigree was distinguished. Some of his ancestors having made their marks on the times in which they lived, as Peter was destined to do in his own life. He grew up as part of a close-knit, loving and happy middle-class family. References being made in family correspondence of Peter and his sister, very much enjoying blackberrying, having moved to live in Nebworth, Hertfordshire. Peter had a strong belief instilled in him during childhood, which remained with him throughout his life. This aspect of his character was much apparent when, at the age of 62, he wrote and delivered the sermon to the congregation at this church on Remembrance Sunday. Following prep school, Peter was sent to Monmouth College. He proved to be academically bright and a good sportsman, with preferences for hockey and cricket. While at Monmouth, Peter considered the headmaster, C.F. Scott, to be a first-class head whose influence was beneficial during this stage of Peter's education. Peter observed the authority and respect the head commanded and was also stimulated by the head's cultural interests, noting in particular the Elizabethan theatre and the works of Shakespeare. In fact, Peter claimed to have formed the idea of a military career because he was inspired by Henry V, a statue of whom is in the town's main square. History, particularly military, was also a subject that attracted his attention during Peter's formative years at school. And he decided to join the officers' training corps. He gained his Certificate A infantry syllabus as a member of the Junior Division Officers' Training Corps of Monmouth School. Contingent at the age of 17 in 1932. This qualification entitled him to a commission in a supplementary reserve. Upon leaving Monmouth School, he became an undergraduate at Trinity College, Oxford, reading modern history with military history as a special subject. It was at Oxford that he began to study what was to become his lifelong passion, the English Civil War. He was always a royalist and made no apologies for his firmly held belief that no matter how bad the king was, it was treason to take up arms against him. Unfortunately, his fascination with this period in history was not shared by the examiners who failed to set any questions about it for his finals in 1937. Since he studied little else, the result was disappointing. He had gained only a third. During his time at university studying history, however, he had been introduced to the hobby of war gaming and had become an enthusiastic participant. The battles were more of miniature exercises, many encompassing the period between 1702 and 1815, and reinforced Peter's interest in military history, particularly the more technical aspects. He would always be willing to campaign in any period if asked. Undoubtedly, Peter was well educated, and as, and as an early American president, Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826, once said, education is the key to success. And as pointed out by Victorian British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, 1804 to 1881, in a speech made in 1874, that it is, quote, upon the education of the people of this country that the fate of this country 
Depends. I'm going to invite you to stand now and we're going to declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and had and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please do take a seat. The soldier who would valiant be. Shortly after leaving university in August 1937, Peter was commissioned as a university candidate, second lieutenant in the Territorial Army unattached list. By February 1939, he had joined the 2nd Battalion, the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiment. As the storm cloud clouds for war were gathering and deciding upon a military career, Peter transferred from a territorial to a regular commission. His career as a professional soldier began in October 1939, when his battalion left for France as part of the British Expeditionary Force. It is worth mentioning that throughout his military career, Peter kept a more or less continuous war journal. Full justice cannot be done by our short presentation, either to his distinguished career as a soldier or to his extraordinary life in post-war years until his death in September 1988. Peter records in his war journal that he was soon wounded in action being shot in the ankle. He was amongst the thousands rescued and brought back to England from Dunkirk in June 1940. An unpromising start to his military career. Meantime, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, to combat loss of morale at home and what might have seemed like defeat to our foes, set about increasing and utilising the numbers of Britain's special forces. Peter was attracted to this style of military warfare, joined number three commando in 1940 in the first selection of officers after its formation, and by 1944 had assumed overall command in the temporary rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Peter's natural confidence in belief in himself combined with his positive attitude, perseverance and skills of leadership, resulted in him being highly suited to undertaking what was expected of his service in a more maverick element of the army. He was a larger than life, unflappable and highly intelligent character who was unquestionably very courageous. During the period from July 1940 until June 1944, Peter was involved in numerous operations with special forces and on June the 6th, the D-Day landings of Operation Overlord, he led Number 3 Commando at Sword Beach. He was involved in subsequent actions in Normandy until September 1944, when he was trans transferred to the Southeast Asian Theatre of Operations with the 3rd Commando Brigade. Post-war, Peter remained in the Army, returning to his original Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiment. He further served for three years in command of the 9th Infantry Regiment Arab Legion in Jordan. During this period, a landmark event in Peter's life occurred when in June 1950, at the age of 35, he married Joan Rathbone. Joan had been previously married and had a young daughter, Marilyn. Peter's exploits as a commando resulted in becoming one of the most decorated soldiers of World War II, 
for his gallant and distinguished services to his country. St Mary's is honoured to be home to the display of people's awards, which can be seen on the wall adjacent to the memorial window. They are Distinguished Service Order, a military cross with two bars. Peter retired from the army in 1959, holding the honorary rank of Brigadier, and was subsequently appointed Reader in Military History at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. We've heard there of Peter Young's Valour. We're now going to sing a song that picks up that theme of courage and bravery. Who would true valour see? Please will you stand? After 20 challenging and action-packed years in the army, Peter could be forgiven if he found the return to everyday life somewhat humdrum and uneventful. This phase of his life saw Peter in the role of a more scholarly academic with a developing and promising career as a military historian. Nonetheless, he had lost none of his panache and his fascination with and interest in the Civil War remained close to his heart. So it was no surprise when he decided to write a book about the Battle of Hedge Hill, which in October 1642 was the first major battle of the Civil War, with both sides claiming victory. On the anniversary of the battle on 23rd of October 1967, the book was released, and with Peter's undoubted influence, he and his publishers decided upon a melodramatic an original launch party at the Castle Inn, which stood up near the site of King Charles I's headquarters before the battle, occupying a commanding position on the crest of Edge Hill, a splendid view of the battlefield below. For the launch party, Peter and his friends attired themselves in somewhat unrefined 17th century costume, some borrowing armour. There was a tent to exhibit a diorama of the battle with Two soldiers, the words of late Peter Dix, posted outside who were dressed in cardboard buff coats with clothesline props for pikes. The success and experience of what was a unique book launch captured the imagination of those involved with ever-expanding ideas gathering impetus. At a meeting at the Mitre Inn in Oxford in February 1968, Peter was responsible for introducing the idea of forming a reenactment society called the Sealed Knot. This name was chosen because historically the Sealed Knot was a royalist secret society 
that from 1653 had plotted for the restoration of the monarchy. In order to develop his bold concept, Peter needed a plan, an event. A parade at Frimley Park in July 1968 was arranged with Peter consulting his address book and contacting anybody he thought might be willing to take part. He admitted to being surprised by the numbers he attracted. The dress code was cavalier, with varied and fascinating results, but no doubt colourful and interesting. A year on from his book launch saw Peter on the 23rd of October 1968 take to the saddle as Captain General of the Sealed Knot, leading a charge of Royalist cavalry with an army about 200 and at least one cannon at the battlefield of Edge Hill. The media were informed on this event, which also attracted a crowd of about 800 spectators, despite there being no opposing army. A situation in urgent need of being addressed. An offer to raise an army of Parliament came from John Adair, whose path had crossed Peter's when John was undertaking his national service as a second lieutenant in the Scots Guards between 1953 and 55. Peter was in command of the 9th Regiment of the Arab Legion to which John was posted. And later on, during 1961 to 67, John worked as a senior lecturer at Sandhurst. As an early member of the Sealed Knot, John set about recruiting an army for Parliament at Basinghouse in March 1969, which later in the year at the Battle of Master Moor reenactment, assisted by senior division of Sandhurst cadets, provided meaningful opposition to Peter's army of cavaliers. It was in 1969 at this battle that both sides were represented and is recorded that most fought with great gusto. Well, I'm going to encourage you to come and sing with great gusto. Now fight the good fight with all thy might. Please would you stand up and take a collection during this hymn.
Lord, heal us. Lord, pray for us. heal us. We pray for Charles, our King, for the leaders of our nations, and for all who work for peace, justice, and freedom. May we all learn from our past, and may old injuries be forgiven and old hatreds buried. Give us courage to our war, bitterness and hatred, and peace peace. Make us instruments of your peace. Let your glory be all over the earth. Deepen our compassion for all who suffer from sickness, grief, or trouble. In your presence, we may be fast strength. We pray for all those in need or want, and for all those who relieve their need or share in your work of healing. May Christ and our Lord, bring us back to Christ and Christ, who is the Lord We remember those who have died. O Lord, who has taught us through your holy word that the night is far spent and the day is at hand, <coughs> awaken us to live as children of light and of the day, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For his sake, who died with us and rose again. Amen. Amen. The Legacy of the Sealed Knot Peter Young saw that there was both public and media interest in keeping history alive through reenacting and experiencing it. People from all walks of life wished to become members of the growing and evolving society. The aims of our founder were not to glorify war, but both to honour those who died for their beliefs and to educate the public about this period in our history. In due course, it became necessary to adopt a business approach to the expanding society's administration. Remarkably, the sealed knot is now in its 55th year, during which time it has become a limited company and a registered charity. It is, with 3,500 members, the biggest reenactment society in Europe and at its height had 7,000 members. Our founder, Peter Young, often referred to as the Brig, remained at the helm as Captain General until his resigna resignation at the Sealed Knot AGM in 1977, when age was beginning to catch up on him. Nevertheless, the Brig maintained his interest in the Sealed Knot until the very end with the role of Captain General remaining uniquely his own, even today. His life was one of distinction and achievement, beginning with an illustrious military career of 20 years, becoming the most decorated commando of World War II. This was followed by his career as an historical author, and in harmony with his experiences, talents, and sheer charisma, becoming the founder of the Sealed Knot. He is now, deservedly, part of history himself. We want to share some reminiscences of the Brig with you, beginning with a couple of stories from his time as a commando in the war. During Peter's soldiering in Burma, he took his troops to assault a Japanese strongpoint. In the lines further back, a furious firefight could be heard to erupt in the jungle. As it went on and on, a fellow officer radioed to Peter to ask if he would like some support. No, thank you, Peter replied. I've got their undivided attention. This won't take long. On D-Day, crossing the channel with fellow commandos in an open landing craft, they were cold, seasick and soaked by the rough seas when Peter noticed that the naval officer at the helm had apparently throttled back the engines. He strode up to him. Why have you slowed down, he demanded. To which the naval officer replied, Well, sir, we're early. 
Peter instantly responded, I really don't think the Germans will mind. Open her up. As he was a soldier soldier, for the many recruits who flocked to enlist in his private army, it was a delight for any of them to be taken for the same by the brig. In support of this statement, I will briefly meet, move aside for our previous captain of yeomen, Cap, uh, Colonel General Peter Bloomfield, and our current captain, Colonel General Colin Bissett. They will both speak from personal experience of the Brigadier and the Sealed Knot. Colonel General Bloomfield. April 1969. You are most welcome to the Knot. That was my first contact with Peter Young, the most cordial letter from him in reply to mine sent to Sandhurst. It followed the reenactment at Basing House in March. He assigned me to Hinton's loyal greycoats as a pikeman and suggested that I might form a cavalier company. This became number three Hinton's and took the name of Lord Capel's. I was now a member of the Sealed Knot Society of Cavaliers. That is how the society was styled in its very first years. Formed in a way as a sort of antidote to the much older Cromwellian Association, which is a very different thing. I first met our Captain General at a mini muster in Beaconsfield on the 3rd of May 1969 and was duly impressed. He had what I would describe as presence. The most important thing he said was to get kitted up as soon as possible. Not so easy in those days because we had no traders row. My first major muster, and the sealed not biggest to date, was that on Marston Moor in June 1969, a reenactment of the Great Battle of 1644. Parliament was still light on numbers, which were made up by the army. It was literally a hard-fought occasion. My pot helmet was struck from my head. At that time, I wore a wig and a false beard. I lost them. It was, a, it was a real melee. I was further impressed by Peter Young that weekend. Whereas he wanted to ensure that his army behaved in a disciplined manner, he also recognised that sealed not members were not professional soldiers and were there to enjoy the weekend. Not an easy balance, but one he always got right. So as we were marching along with our heads down to try and keep in step, suddenly a voice <coughs> boomed out, keep your heads up. Yet later, the brigadier who had welcomed everyone to camp went around all the tents to make sure that everyone was okay. Mark, I think, of a good officer. I must have done something right, because at a small muster in Leatherhead the following month, the brig, as we referred to him, thrust a thunder flash into my hand with instructions to throw it at the enemy column as it advanced. He was a great one for pyrotechnics. I recall a few years later when he organised a small muster in Ripple being literally blown up because he'd laid a charge in the ground and ordered everybody to charge towards the camera. The sealed knot authenticity police would have had a field day in those early years. 
we were dressed and armed as best we could. For the Cropredi Bridge reenactment in 1970, I managed to kit myself and some of the company out in armour. It looked very good, but it was from the film Cromwell. Rubberized plastic, curassier suits, and pipemen's back breast and tassets. On the other hand, we did use metal headed halberds. On the battlefield, Peter Young could be seen in company with his personal bodyguard, the formidable Black Guard. And he had an escort made up of ladies in men's garb, the apricots, so called from the colour of their costume. I got some good memories of the first campaign I went on across the Scottish Hills, 1972. I was told by Marcus Hinton to scout ahead of his regiment. And I came across Peter Young lying comfortably in the heather. He'd come off his horse. He looked at me and smiled. Carry on, Peter, but don't get captured. He was quite cheerful because he had his flask with him. I got to know the brig quite well by that time, as he appointed me for some reason to serve on the society's inner council, a bit of a minnow I was amongst some very illustrious names, which you will know. And he may be yeoman in 1980. Peter Young had a way of speaking to you without any way of putting you down but getting a point across. I recall the occasion in 1974 at Warwick Castle when he inspected my unit. Peter has said, you no longer have a company, you have a regiment. And then, as a quiet aside, and there's nothing but a bit of brass I wouldn't do for your helmet. So we meet today to honour our Captain General and to keep his, li his memory alive. It's 35 years since Peter Young died, so those who have met him are increasingly few in number. I had great respect for our Captain General and I count myself fortunate to have known him personally for some 20 years. He had charisma and without his drive, energy and leadership we would not have the society that you see today. Thank you. Brigadier Peter Young was, by any standards, a remarkable man. I had the privilege of first meeting him during my time as a cadet at the RMA Sandhurst. By this time, Peter Young, following 20 years of exceptional service in the army, had been appointed to run the military history department at the academy and his reputation, imagination and enthusiastic approach to this role was already becoming established. <clears throat> Each year, the senior division of Sanders cadets went away to an overseas training area, which in 1961 was Portugal, where, apart from training for modern days, we were able to visit some battlefields of Wellington's Peninsula War under the personal direction of Peter Young. In those days, battlefield tours were virtually unknown, but were most interesting and thought-provoking, especially under the leadership of Peter Young. Moreover, as an added extra highlight of the exercise, we learned that the Brigadier had persuaded the modern-day Portuguese army and government to make arrangements for us to lead a grand parade through the centre of Lisbon, with bayonets fixed, drums beating and colours flying. 
This experience was a unique and one-off 20th century event in recognition of Wellington's triumphal march through Lisbon during the Peninsular War. I remember it as a proud and memorable event in time during my military training in the country of our oldest ally, Portugal. <clears throat> Moving on to just over 50 years ago, in 1972, having left the army, now living in Nantwich with my wife and two sons, and being interested in military history, a press report drew my attention to the reintroduction of the commemoration of the Civil War siege and battle of Nantwich in Cheshire. The latter being referred to as Holy Holy Day. I was keen to discover more and subsequently heard about the formation of a sealed knot by the charismatic brigadier Peter Young. It was at that time that my membership and that of my family commenced. As a valiant soldier, an acclaimed military historian, and the inspirational founder of the Sealed Knot, the Brigadier was invited by the BBC in April 1977 to become a castaway in their popular radio programme Desert Island Discs. 35 years after Peter Young died, it is interesting to realise that he appeared on the programme 35 years after it started. Recordings of his performance can now be accessed on BBC Sounds. You may wonder why the tunes played before the colours arrived were secular. It is because they featured in that 1977 list of the Briggs favourites. At the end of this service, a tribute will be paid to the Brig when one of his chosen favourite tunes, Les Huguenots, is played on the organ as you leave the church. Oh, and in case you're wondering, his choice of book as a castaway was a large blank one with lots of pencils. And his luxury item would be a ton of treasure, dated about 1642, because it would be useful to have if he was ever rescued. Another of his favourite tunes in the programme was Over the Hills and Far Away, familiar to many here. It came from The Beggar's Opera, written by John Gay. Robin Barnard, the church organist, is going to play this version, arranged by Johann Christoph Pepusch, for that opera. Apparently it was based on an older tune. Thank you, Robin. As a child, Peter Young had met and been inspired by Rudyard Kipling. Perhaps he heard and understood the following lines from Kipling's poem, Edge Hill Fight. For king or for commonwealth, no matter what they say, the first dry rattle of new-drawn steel 
changes the world of today. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I've been asked to speak about Peter as a military historian. We worked closely together in the 1970s when I was a young scholar working on my first book. It helped our friendship a lot that we were both royalists and that I had an unfeigned admiration and affection for him. It helped even more, perhaps, that we both had an unfeigned admiration and affection for wine, a good bottle of which usually formed the centrepiece of our deliberations. It's worth making the point that although none of us would be here if Peter had not had a tremendous ability and reputation as a historian of the English Civil War. But it's worth pointing out this was only a quarter of his interests and his output as a military historian. His other fields were conflicts in which he himself was engaged, the Second World War and the succeeding conflicts in the Middle East, he also wrote about other wars, such as the American War of Independence, the Napoleonic Wars, and World War I. He wrote general military histories, such as one on the whole story of the British Army, and a dictionary of battles. But among the historians of all those other fields, he ranks generally in the second position. It's as a historian of the English Civil War that by 1970 he was absolutely preeminent. So we have to ask why. First reason is simply that the military history of that war had been neglected. Even a good narrative historian who saw the importance of events and personalities, such as Dame Veronica Wedgwood, didn't really understand warfare. The Brig certainly did. The second reason is that his basic approach in books was a very good and a distinctive one. The format of the campaign and the battle, whether as a series in a narrative history or as a standalone book leading up to a great battle. This had a number of spin-off advantages. The first is simply it's a really exciting and compelling narrative structure and also a very old one. Many a thrilling tale from ancient epic to modern cinema has depended on the introduction of the audience to two mighty and opposed adversaries who meet in an all-out fight for supremacy at the climax of the story. The second advantage was it led Peter to pioneer what subsequently became a major scholarly sub-discipline, and that's battlefield archaeology. To write his book on Edgehill, he actually went around the field finding musket balls stuck in trees to estimate the weight and direction of fire. Transmuted into the new technology of the metal detector, this has become the major way of studying battlefields. And above all, number three, Peter patiently reconstructed units. The companies and regiments of rival armies through the medium of his card index of officers. This traced the careers even of the non-commissioned. Deciding what actually happened in the course of pre-modern battles is often very confusing. By contrast, once reconstructed, 
the shape and form of armies can be known forever. And so his work on this has been enduring, endearing, and most of it need never be done it again. Peter saw immediately from his own experience that an army is a body of people assembled for action, and he built up his view of the Civil War from that solid foundation. History, friends, is essentially a combination of context and circumstance. Peter Young got both together perfectly. Reading from St. Mark's Gospel. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is called man, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Would you pray with me for a moment? Heavenly Father, as we reflect upon this list of evils, touch our hearts and heal them, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
All these evils come from inside and defile a person. I know a lot about evil. I dare say we all do. We all know that struggle between the temptation to do good and the temptation to do evil. And I guess we all know which one usually wins in our lives. We know which wins in public. We know which one wins in private as well. Jesus said something pretty challenging about our hearts there. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then he has a great long list of things that we do wrong. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus is locating the problem of the human race, slap bang in the middle of the human race, in the middle of the human heart. And Jesus never lays out a problem like that without also offering a solution. But it's a problem that people have been wrestling with for generations. Generations of preachers will have stood here down the years wrestling with the problem of the human heart, not least a former lay preacher of this parish, more commonly known to you as the Brig. So how do you fix the human heart? Well, of course, over the years, people have come up with all sorts of answers. Well, one solution is what I call better than-ism. I might be rotten on the inside, but as long as I'm better than Stalin, Hitler, and whichever infamous figure is being slagged off in the press at the moment, then I don't need to worry. Or do you? After all, who wants... Well, he was kinder than Stalin, as their epitaph. Another way people try to deal with it is by moving the moral goalposts. So if my heart is leading me to do some bad thing, maybe the solution is to redefine morality to include whatever it is I want. We just make it up as we go. A few years back, there was an Anglican vicar who got into a bit of bother with the press for preaching that stealing was okay, as long as it was from Tesco rather than from a corner shop. I dread to think where his wine cellar came from. But does moving the goalpost like that really solve the problem of evil? I don't think it does, does it? Then there's the problem of just denying that there's any evil in us at all. People aren't flawed. Society is. We're fundamentally good. It's merely poor education, bad parenting, lack of opportunity and lack of sleep that makes us do wrong things. This is the West Side Story theory of life. Uh, if, if this were the West Side Story reenactment society rather than uh, the sealed knot, then of course we would all get up and sing G. Officer Krupke at this point. But I'll not make you endure that. I'll merely quote, Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, Krupke you've got to understand it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies. Our fathers all are drunks. Golly Moses, naturally we're punks. But you can't blame your parents and society for everything, can you? Otherwise, well, somebody like me, who's pretty well educated and had great parents, would never do anything bad. And I can assure you, that's not the case. Maybe science has an answer for us. By observation of the natural world, we can come up with an understanding of morality built on what is natural in the animal kingdom. It sort of sounds lovely. We've all seen the Lion King. What a beautiful natural order they have, though they do skip out what lions do to feed themselves, don't they? You couldn't run the NHS that way. One common solution to the problem of the human heart, modern solution, I suppose, is virtue signalling. Boasting about the good things you do and the good causes you support to cover what's up inside. I might be rotten inside, but I'm backing all the right causes on Twitter at the moment. But it doesn't really solve the problem either. That's just boasting about your own goodness. It's just hypocrisy. And it's not really a new thing. As you probably noticed from our Bible reading, Jesus had a real run-in with some first-century virtue signalers, the Pharisees, who had invented hundreds of little rules that they very publicly practiced to let everybody know how good they were. These guys were virtue signalling on an industrial scale long before Facebook and Instagram existed. The start of the reading, Jesus and his disciples are getting it in the ear from them because they're eating with hands that are unwashed. What a scandal. But then for the Pharisees, good hygiene was not a matter of keeping yourself from getting a funny tummy. It was a religious observance for them. Some of their other virtue signaling rules were there in the passage as well. There was abstaining from eating various foods for religious reasons. Now, there are some Old Testament rules about that. 
But the Pharisees took it to a whole new level by inventing even more rules. And then there was that rather strange-sounding Corbyn rule. It's nothing to do with Jeremy Corbyn, if you can remember him. This is all about social care, in fact, and particularly about how you care for your parents. Now, as any authentic roundhead or cavalier would have been able to tell me, the fifth commandment is... Mm, Honour your father and mother. Thank you very much. I knew somebody would get it. That's brilliant. Honour your father and mother. And what does that mean? Well, well, in Jesus' day, it was generally agreed that honouring your father and mother involved looking after them when they got old. But what if you didn't want to? Well, the Pharisees had a loophole. They declared their money Corban, which meant they didn't have to spend it on their parents. They could dedicate it to God, which meant they could do whatever they wanted with it and still look religious. It's a bit of a scam, really, isn't it? Virtue signalling, covering up the mess on the inside with something that looks good or virtuous on the outside. So if the solution isn't to deny there's a problem with our hearts or to blame society for it or to move the goalposts or come up with some crazy rules to excuse bad behaviour, what is it? Well, it's the solution that Peter Young learned as a child and which would have been drummed into him at his confirmation that it's only Jesus' death and resurrection that can solve the problem of the human heart. On the cross, like the great commanding officer that Jesus is, he took responsibility for all of our mistakes sacrificed himself to deal with them three days later he rose from the grave bringing new life a new beginning which we can all share in we can't fix the past but jesus can deal with the consequences but it's not automatic it's something we opt into it's a choice that begins with us recognizing where the problem lies in our hearts acknowledging that we really are bad news but then embracing the good news that there is hope. You might have questions, doubts or concerns about that. Everyone who has ever taken a step towards trusting God has. There was a, a wonderful medieval theologian, Thomas Aquinas, had a phrase for it. He called it faith-seeking understanding. It's an invitation to approach God not with total knowledge of him, after all, whose mind would ever be sufficient for that task? Instead, we approach him with a simple hope that he's good to keep his promises, that he will meet our deepest needs and solve our greatest problem. And the strange thing is, when we approach him like that, we find that things that used to worry us either get answered or no longer seem important. That's what faith-seeking understanding looks like. So if you want to take that step towards him, start where Jesus started in our reading with the problem of your own heart. Be open with God about what your heart is like. It won't surprise him. He knows anyway. Just admit it to him and say sorry. It's remarkable to think that on a civil war battlefield, this would have been the thoughts in every man and woman's heart as they faced conflict, trusting that however they met their fate on the battlefield, they would do it safe and secure in the knowledge that Christ has their back, no matter what. And that equips you with a confidence to face an enemy with courage. It might not equip you to Equip, face the enemy with the courage that the brig showed in those death-defying feats in Burma or on D-Day. I think that does take a special extra kind of courage. But it will stand you in good stead for when it is time, your time, to have your name added to the list of the fallen sealed knot members, which I'm going to read from in a few moments' time. Until then, let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to approach you with faith-seeking understanding. When we're honest, we know the failings of our hearts. So help us also to trust your medicine, receive your healing, and know the confidence that you offer 
in the face of all things, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please would you stand as we remember the sealed knot members notified as having passed away during the past year. Book of Remembrance 2022. Jeffrey James Ball. Jane Hay. Herbert Rousel. June Rosemary Timothy. Book of Remembrance 2023. Thomas Rennie Aldwinkle. Shelley Ann Bruce, Hamish Buchan, Morris Bundy, Gerard Patrick Cahill, Robert Stephen Corkwell, Jeffrey Martin Hartnell, Rodney Howe, Michael John Paley, Gwyneth Shenton. Would you pray with me as we remember them? We entrust to you, eternal God, those times when we can see only shadows and lose sight of the hope to come, the times when sickness and suffering seem so senseless, life so fragile, war so unstoppable, and death so permanent. Bless us with the assurance that you are in all things, the tragic and the beautiful, the nightmare and the dream, the light and the darkness. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the peace of the world, today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. We now sing our final hymn.
You know, and have a care, water your arms. You join me on the final page of our order of service. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Today we come together to remember before God our sister Joan, to give thanks for her life and to comfort one another in our grief. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because you made us in your own image and gave us gifts in body, mind and spirit. We thank you now for Joan and what she means to each of us and to those members of the sealed knot and her support to Peter Young in his service to the society. As we honour her memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift, including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Your arms! Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant to us, Lord God, to trust you not for ourselves alone, but also for those whom we love and who are hidden from us by the shadow of death, that as we believe your power to have raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, so may we trust your love to give eternal life to all who believe in him. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeoman, have a care to your right and left hand face. Yeoman, wheeling to your right, march on! <laughs>